to the 27th lecture in the Bishop and the Most Reverend John MacArthur series on the Catholic Church in the 21st century. St. Edward created the lecture series to honor Bishop McCarthy, who led the Diocese of Austin from 1985 to 2001, and to underscore the university's commitment to its Catholic roots and its Holy Cross heritage. Over the past 13 years, following Father William Byron's uh, initial, initial lecture on the American Church in the year 2050, we still have time to check to see if he was right. <laughs> uh, we have explored other topics such as faith, feminism, and, Amer and American Catholic history with Kathleen Cummings, cultural and political trends and their impact on Catholic health care with Dan O'Brien, Catholic teaching and America's role in the world with Most Reverend Robert McElroy, global Catholicism, the Church in the Americas with Michelle Gonzalez, and Migration and Mission, a Holy Cross Vision with Daniel Grudy, CSC. <clears throat> this afternoon, we are privileged to have with us as our speaker, the Reverend Thomas Rausch, SJ, and T. Marie Clinton, Professor of Catholic Theology at Loyola Marymount in California. Uh, Father Rausch has a PhD in religion from Duke University. He is a specialist in the areas of Christology, ecclesiology, and, and humanism, and he has published 18 books with over 250 articles and reviews. He has lectured internationally, and, he work, and his works have been translated into nine different languages. From 1981 to 1985, Father Rausch served as director of campus ministry at LMU. In 1983 to 1984, he was appointed by the Secretariat for Christian Unity as Catholic tutor uh, to the Ecumenical Institute, the World Council of Churches Study Center at Bossi, uh, uh, Switzerland. He was chair of the Department of Theological Studies at Loyola Marymount from 1994 to 2002. Over the fat last 50 plus years, the Catholic community has struggled often in the face of significant resistance, to realize the promise of a renewed church envisioned by Vatican II. Father Rausch, in his lecture this afternoon, will explore the steps Pope Francis has taken toward renewal of the church in the 21st century. Join me, please, in welcoming Father <coughs> Thomas P. Rausch to discuss Pope Francis reclaiming the vision of Vatican II.
Not a few cardinals felt that the butler was right in their judgment. The renewal of the church initiated by the Second Vatican Council has stalled under the last two pontificates. And its, its vision had not been fully realized. The Council's doctrine on collegiality included the bishops with the Pope and the government of the church. Karl Rahner saw what he called the Senado Collegial Principle, which triumphed at the Council as contributing to the decisive beginnings of the agiornamento required by the Church. But both Pope John Paul II and Pope Benedict XVI tended to recenter authority and decision making in Rome, increasing the power of the Roman Curia at the expense of national and regional episcopal conferences. The result was that rather than being at the service of the Pope and the bishops and the governments of the Church, the Curia held a position between the bishops uh, and the Pope, diminishing the ability of the, Pope, uh, the bishops to act as they judged best for their churches. And that really comes from the, the late uh, Archbishop John Quinn of San Francisco, who was a wonderful bishop, uh, and who made this point in a couple of his books on the renewal of the papacy. Many saw this recentralization as an effort to unify the church around the doctrinal uniformity by authorities, uh, by, by authorities in Rome without taking into account the voices representing different social and cultural contexts. A process described by Richard Gallardi as a pronounced magisterial activism. In 1995, several efforts were made to attribute infallibility to certain teachings of the ordinary universal magisterium. Among them, the CDS response to the dubium or doubt about Pope John Paul II's 1994 statement that the Church had no authority to confer ordination on women. Ordinatio sacerdotalis, and also the 1998 Professio Fide extension of infallibility to definitive declarations of the magisterium. And there are certain other examples of a resettering of authority in Rome. For example, two Gotham bishops were named without consulting the bishops of the province. I've had bishops tell me that themselves. I mean, you know, the new bishops kind of parachuted in there, uh, and nobody had asked the bishops what the, the needs were, let alone the lady. Let alone the lady. Church historian like Massimo Vagioli see the extraordinary synod of 1985 as a landmark turning point in the interpretation of the Council. Some in the Senate feared that the metaphor of the people of God, which many saw as the Council's root metaphor for the Church, implied an illegitimate democratization of the Church and its authority. From this point on, from the point of this Senate in 1985, it was virtually replaced by an emphasis on communio, privileging the hierarchical structure of the church. The synod sought to limit collegiality to the relationships between the pope and the bishops, while the role of episcopal conferences was diminished. Cardinal Ratzinger echoed this view. He stressed that episcopal conferences had no mandate to teach and could not be said to represent a collegial exercise of episcopal power. That was supposed to be a collegial function for local Episcopal conferences to teach. And this was essentially confirmed in John Paul the uh, 1998 Moto Proprio Apostolos Suos. The Synod of Bishops, which was established by Pope Paul VI on September 15, 1965, as the Council was ending, the Council saw it as an instrument for a more collegial exercise of authority, which is an interesting question. How do we have another ecumenical council? 2,500 bishops in Vatican II are 4,500 today. So we really need a new structure. Uh, and this is one thing a uh, renewed uh, Episcopal Synod might be able to do to truly represent the, the global Episcopal. <clears throat> but in, by anticipating the Council's actions, the Synod is set up by Pope Paul lacked real authority. It was summoned when the Pope thought it opportune it was directly and immediately sub subordinated to the authority of the Bishop of Rome. In commenting on the Synod shortly after the Council, Joseph Ratzinger cautiously expressed some disappointment that, as others had observed, the Synod as constituted showed, quote, a profound difference between 
the Synod as conceived by the Council and its papal realization. A collegial organ had been turned into an instrument of the primate to use as he wished. Close quotes. And that's Joseph Rossi. <laughs> the synod in practice has become a disappointment. According to Michael Fahey, each new synod attracts less and less attention. The structure of their sessions has become unwieldy. They have become rituals with little practical impact on the life of the church. Officials of the Curia controlled its agenda and told the bishops what could be discussed, and many bishops simply saw it as a waste of their time. Canis Leo Les Orsi, one of my favorite people, an absolutely fearless canon lawyer who's now at Georgetown and he's about 95, noted that the structures and norms imposed on the episcopacy reveal, quote, a deep theological imbalance in the life of the church. The function of the episcopate has been taken over to a great extent by the primacy. Recentering authority in Rome also affected the church's liturgy. Vatican II gave considerable authority to regional Episcopal conferences to adapt their liturgies, but in the post-conciliar period, Rome, Rome became increasingly interventionist. At the 1998 Synod of Bishops for Asia, the Japanese bishops wondered why they should obtain Roman approval for Japanese translations of liturgical and catechetical texts. <laughs> <laughs> Japanese and Rome. <laughs> Indian bishops argued for the right of local churches to develop their own methods and expressions for preaching the gospel. A translation of the Roman Missal or Sacramentary long under preparation by the International Commission on English and the Liturgy, ISOL, as it's called, with representatives of 11 English-speaking conferences and approved by their bishops was turned down by Rome in 1998. And everybody said that was a great translation. I'm talking about the new translation so many of us find so problematic. In 2001, the Congregation for Divine Worship issued the instruction Liturgium Authenticum, overturning much of ISIL's work. ISIL's membership was reconstituted, and the instruction maintained a strict translation, mandated a strict translation of the original Latin, extending even to syntax, rhythms, and capitalization. Translations should be based not on the principle of dynamic or functional equivalence, but rather on the principle of formal equivalence, in other words, a strictly literal translation of the Latin. When the revised English translation of the Roman Missal was adopted in 2011, with an estimated 10,000 changes added in Rome after the bishops uh, signed off on it, uh, we ended up with this present translation. Its cumbersome language proved it to be very unpopular, especially with priests. Uh, I consider myself a fairly good reader, and I've been caught in the middle of some of these endless prefaces with all this word clauses or, or uh, um, opening prayers. You just get tongue tied. You know, it doesn't work in English. The current translation of the Gloria with repeated phrases in Latin I find particularly awkward. You may have experienced that. You know, everybody's still using their little books to, to read the Gloria. The new translation also revised certain jointly developed common texts for the ordinary of the Mass, such as the Gloria, the Credo, the Sanctus, the Agnus Dei, as well as certain dialogical responses and acclamations. With the unhappy result that Catholics and Protestants who were using this earlier translation would no longer be praying with the same translations as a real step back for ecumenism. Cardinal Medina, prefect of the Congregation for Divine Worship, specifically rejected these efforts for a common text in Liturgium Authentica. There's also the new emphasis on the Tridentine liturgy, first allowed under Pope John Paul II, and then with priests given general permission by Pope Benedict. Uh, to celebrate what he called the extraordinary form of the liturgy. From this came the idea popular in some conservative circles of a reform of the reform. So, reclaiming this vision, that's what I want to focus on. Then came the surprising election of Pope Francis, the first pope from the Americas, the first from the Global South, the first Jesuit pope. From the beginning, it was evident that the new pope sought to carry through the reforming vision of Vatican II. 
For Francis, renewal is always for the sake of mission. One month after his election, he appointed a council of eight cardinals from around the world, the Gang of Eight, as it was called, raised a, 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 to nine a year later with the appointment of Cardinal Parallel as the Secretary of State. And the purpose of this was to advise him on carrying out the mandate he received from the conclave. Eight months after his election to the See of Peter, he issued his apostolic exhortation, Evangelii Gaudium, his vision for the renewal of the church. In a new book unpacking this document, uh, Gerard Mannion calls its ecclesiological vision nothing short of revolutionary. In the same volume, Massimo Vaggioli describes Evangelium Gaudium, Evangelium Gaudium as an effort to recapture not just the letter, but also the spirit of Vatican II, moving it beyond the culture wars and the intercatholic debate on the liturgy. Francis is clearly open to the new. Later in this text, in the Daily Gaudium, he says, Pastoral ministry in a missionary key seeks to abandon that, abandon that complacent attitude that says, we've always done it that way. How many times have you heard that when you're trying to use some, some new approach to something? To illustrate Francis's efforts to reclaim the vision of the Second Vatican Council, I'd like to consider his reclaiming the metaphor of the church as the people of God, his emphasis on synodality, his concern for a listening church, including some new initiatives in regards to liturgy of women, his approach to church doctrine, described by Richard Gil Gilardi as the pastorality of doctrine. I think that's a very important uh, understanding of, of Francis's understanding of doctrine. And his, certainly his desire for a church of and for the poor. So first of all, um, the people of God. Pope Francis's favorite metaphor for the church is the holy, faithful people of God. Thus, he has reclaimed this important metaphor. But it's much more than a metaphor for Francis. His understanding of the church as the people of God is profoundly theological. He stresses that the people of God itself constitutes a subject, for it is the whole church, the totality of God's people, that complex web of relationships that takes place in the human community, he says, into which God enters. He has frequently argued that all the faithful, considered as a whole, are infallible in matters of faith, which Vatican II said. But people display what he calls an infallibilitas in credendo, an infallibility in believing, through a supernatural sense of the faith of all the people working together. We should not think, he says, that thinking with the church means only thinking with the hierarchy of the church. For Francis, the church is the totality of God's people, an approach that stresses baptism over ordination. Very interesting for those of you familiar with the spiritual exercises. You know, there's that section at the end of the rules for thinking with the church that are written in the context of the Reformation. Uh, but Francis is saying, you know, what we really have to understand that is thinking of the whole church, not just with the hierarchy, with the rules, with the, the kind of the doctrinal uh, purity. Secondly, the Sanago church. Early in Evangelii Gaudium, Francis speaks of the need for a profound decentralization, one that touches even magisterial authority. He writes that he does not believe that the papal magisterium should be ex expected to offer a definitive or complete word on every question that affects the church and the world. It is not advisable for the pope to take the place of local bishops in the discernment of every issue which arises in the that arises in their territory. From the beginning of his papal ministry, Francis has taken specific steps to decentralize the way authority uh, works in the church, or as he likes to say, to emphasize citadality. Thus, his reform must be embraced not just the Roman Curia, but the bishops as well as all the faithful. In Evangelii Gaudium, he cites the Second Vatican Council to the effect that Episcopal conferences are in a position, quote, to contribute in many and fruitful ways to the concrete realization of the collegial spirit. Yet this desire has not been fully realized since the juridical status of Episcopal conferences 
which would see them as subjects of specific attributions, including genuine doctrinal authority, has not yet been sufficiently elaborated. Excessive centralization, rather than proving helpful, complicates the church's life and her missionary outreach, he says. That's in number 32 of uh, Evangelium Gaudi, and you might look at the uh, Lumen Gentium, number 23, also. He returned to this theme in a speech marking the 50th anniversary of the Synod of Bishops. He called the Synod one of the most precious legacies of the Second Vatican Council, arguing that it is precisely the path of synodality which God expects of the Church in the third millennium. But how to realize a truly synodal Church? First of all, Francis has got out of his way to revitalize the Synod of Bishops. He has gone out of his way to recognize the authority of his brother bishops. At the beginning of the extraordinary synod on the family in 2014, he encouraged the participants to speak openly and honestly, not holding back for fear of what the Pope might think. I'm sure you've heard this, but let me read this. One general condition and basic one general and basic condition is this: speaking honestly. Let no one say, I cannot say this, they will think this or that of me. It is necessary to say with Parisia all that one feels after the last consistory, this was in 2014, in which the family was discussed, and Cardinal wrote to me saying, what a shame that several cardinals did not have the courage to say certain things out of respect for the Pope, perhaps believing that the Pope might think something else. But this is not good. This is not synodality. Because it is necessary to say all that in the Lord one feels the need to say without polite deference, without hesitation. At the same time, one must listen with humility and welcome with an open heart what your brothers say. Synodality is exercised with these two approaches. Unlike his predecessor, to show the global nature of the Church, he has frequently cited Episcopal conferences from around the world in his own encyclicals and apostolic exhortations. You know, when you read this, the Pope uh, John Paul is cited himself. <laughs> Pope Benedict cited you know, novelists and uh, philosophers. I always love to read his footnotes. He's got some lovely stuff from Dostoevsky and even from the neo Marxist Frankfurt School. Uh, Francis quotes other bishops at other Episcopal conferences from around the world. For example, in his Apostolic Exhortation, he cites six. In La Vada of C, he cites. 13, and in Amoris Laetitia, 9. Another aspect of synodality is the principle of subsidiarity, allowing local decisions to be made at local levels. Not everything has to be decided from our time. Thirdly, um, a listening church. If the whole church possesses an infallibilitas in credendo, and a supernatural census fidei, sense of the faith, then church authority must find effective ways to be attentive to the whole church, or to be a listening church. Uh, it's a term I like to use, it's what Francis has used himself. Francis stressed this in the 50th anniversary speech commemorating the establishment of the Synod of the Bishops. A synodal church, he exclaims, is a church which listens, which realizes that listening is more than simply hearing. It is a mutual listening in which everyone has something to learn. The faithful people, the College of Bishops, the Bishop of Rome, all listening to each other and all listening to the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of Truth, in order to know what he says to the churches. Francis then made reference to the doctrine of the census fidei, the principle, that the faith of the church is born not just by the hierarchy, but the whole church. Uh, again, expressing that the whole church is a, is a subject. The census fidei prevents a rigid separation between an ecclesia gocens and ecclesia discens. Now, those of you who are my age grew up with that. You know, there's the teaching church and the learning church. So the role of the learning church is to listen. Uh, and the role of hierarchy is to teach. Uh, and Francis specifically uh, rules that out. Since the flock, he says, likewise has an instinctive ability to discern the new ways that the Lord is revealing to the church. Thus the church is a true communion, not just of bishops with the Pope, 
but also of the bishops with the faithful. Implicit here is an ecclesiology which calls for a genuine dialogue between pope and bishops, between local churches and Rome, between pastors and their faithful, uh, not a monarchical ecclesiology in which the discernment of faith and decision making uh, comes from the top down this way. As Ormond Rush writes, the census fidelium must be listened to because it is a locus theolog theologicus, a place where the revealing God can be heard speaking to the churches today. And that's the essential question. What is, what is God saying to the churches today? What is the Lord asking of us today in this very different uh, world? If this is so, then, Francis argued, the hierarchy needs to establish ways to consult the faithful not reducing the sense of the faith to a majority opinion in the sociological sense. But it is therefore important, he says, that it is your task to develop criteria for discerning authentic expressions of the census fidelium. For its part, the magisterium has the duty to be attentive to what the Spirit says to the churches through authentic manifestations of the census fidelium. Francis has taken a number of steps for its greater consultation in the life of the church, or a listening church. For example, he does not seem to be against the idea of ordaining married men who have shown an aptitude for ministry, often referred to as very probati, uh, tested men, proved men, to help address the shortage of priests. But he wants the idea to come from reasonable Episcopal conferences, not from the Pope. He doesn't want to fall back himself into this top-down style of government. Increasingly, the Indonesian Episcopal Conferences has several times in the past asked Rome for permission to ordain married men to meet their acute shortage of priests without success. Perhaps they may do this again. Uh, and it's interesting, he's just called for the synod on the Amazon, and some of the officials of Latin America have asked for uh, permission to ordain married men. So it's very interesting to watch the synod as it develops, because the shortage of priests, especially in Latin America, where losing so many to the Pentecostals uh, part of the big problems. 20,000 member parishes with one or two priests that just don't have the kind of priests uh, needed. On August 2nd, 2016, he created a commission to study the possibility of ordaining women deacons, naming among its members Phyllis Zagano, a research scholar who has long been an advocate for the women's theater. When I heard about this, I said, oh my God, I wonder if he named Phyllis Zagano. And there she was. <laughs> she's, she's a scholar who, who clearly knows the history of the women's diaconate in the church. <clears throat> and in October 2007, he called for the Synod on the Amazon and mentioned that. <laughs> on matters liturgical, he has been getting pushback from some of the Congregation for Divine Worship, most recently from Cardinal Sarah uh, of the Congo, the present prefect who has advocated, quote, the reform of the reform has stated that Mass should be celebrated ad orientum, facing the East, priest and people all in the same way. <clears throat> but Francis clearly has other ideas. In 2016, he ordered a review of Liturgicum Atheticum, the instruction responsible for the unpopular current translation of the Roman Missal. According to a 2014 survey conducted by Georgetown University Center for Applied Research Possibly Cara, that's a great uh, source, by the way, of information and statistics on the church. This survey re reported that more than half of the priests in the United States said that it urgently needed to be re revised. Professor Peter Jeffrey of Princeton University described Liturgium Authenticum as the most ignorant statement on the liturgy ever issued by a modern Vatican congregation. That's a pretty strong language. <laughs> Those who wrote it were seriously misinformed and made many misstatements about the Roman liturgical tradition, uh, Professor Jeffrey said. Even more significantly, in August 2017, in an address to liturgists at Italy's Center of Liturgical Action, Francis declared that we can affirm with certainty and with magisterial authority, often taught this way, uh, with magisterial, this magisterial authority, that the liturgical reform is irreversible calling on the authority of his office. In other words, there's no going back. 
Most significantly, in, in August 2017, just a month ago, in his Voto Proprio Magnum Principium, Pope Francis has challenged Canon 838, giving much more responsible this responsibility to Episcopal conferences for preparing liturgical texts. While these texts still need a final confirmation, a confirmatio, not a recognitio, which is a lesser recognitio means permission to publish, yeah, and after we've made changes, confirmatio is going to good work, and let's go on with it. While these texts still need a final confirmation from the Holy See, Archbishop Arthur Roach, Secretary of the Congregation for Divine Worship and the Discipline of the Sacraments, said in his commentary, that Liturgium Authentica must now be interpreted in light of the Pope's modo proprio. As Rita Ferroni has pointed out, Francis's modo proprio goes back to an earlier 1969 instruction on the liturgical translation, which came out under Paul VI. Comme le prévoir, which stressed not the translation of individual words, but the whole communicative act. And this is what the Pope is addressing in this uh, modern Principium. If this is the case, Peroni argues, we cannot continue to excess, insist on the literal word-for-word -word approach that Liturgium Authenticum embodies. And just this week, Francis sent a letter publicly correcting an article attributed in France to Cardinal Serra that argues that the previous norms were still in place. To the contrary, Francis stated that the authority of Liturgium Authenticum was clearly restricted by his voto proprio. This is virtually unprecedented for a public letter from a pope uh, rebuking the cardinal, and he's done this three times and said. The preparation for the recent synod on the family, two synods, provides another example of a, of a listening church. Prior to the synod, Cardinal Lorenzo Baldessari, Secretary General of the Synod, requested bishops around the world to survey their faithful on questions of divorce and remarriage, rules for annulment, Children in marriage is not recognized by the church, contraception, and how to minister to those in same-sex marriages. Though the survey was not always widely distributed, not all the bishops you know, sent this out, and, and sometimes they were sent out in such a complicated form, nobody could figure them out. Uh, a Vatican report released on June 26th of 2014 found that many Christians have difficulty accepting church teachings on key issues, such as birth control, divorce, homosexuality, and cohabitation. What was remarkable about the Cardinal Baldessari's survey was that it represented a consultation of the faithful themselves, not just of the bishops, something virtually unprecedented in the life of the church, especially in something as sensitive as these questions in the area of sexuality, you know, which are so controverted today uh, in our midst. Finally, in June uh, 2014, the International Theological Commission published an important text entitled The Census Fide in the Life of the Church. As we saw earlier, the Census Fide is an important doctrine, but one that has rarely been given the attention that it deserves. The text argues that the faithful are not passive recipients of what the hierarchy teaches. They play a role, it says, in the development of doctrine, sometimes when bishops and theologians have been divided on an issue, and also in the development of the church's moral teaching. It notes that the faithful remain indifferent, when the faithful remain indifferent to doctrine or moral decisions of the magisterium, it may be from a weak faith or from an uncritical embrace of contemporary culture, but it may also indicate that certain decisions have been taken by those in authority without due consideration of the experience and the census for the, of, the, of the faithful, or without sufficient consultation of the faithful by the, the magister. This, this is a remarkable document. You can find it online. The Vatican's got a terrific website. Uh, it's all there. It's relatively short. It's really worth reading. Francis's efforts uh, to, to uh, shape a decentralized listening church have occasioned not a little bit of pushback. Some more conservative voices have accused Francis of undermining or trying to change church doctrine. Considerable controversy has followed the publication of his 2016 Apostolic Exhortation on Family Life, Amoris Laetitia, 
with his emphasis on conscience and discernment. Four cardinals, among them Walter Brandmuller, former president of the Pontifical Commission for Historical Sciences, uh, a German, Raymond Burke, patron of the Knights of Malta, Carlo Carrato, our retired Archbishop of Bologna, and later uh, Joachim Meissner, retired Archbishop of Cologne, asked, asked the Pope to clarify his teachings on five questions related to paragraphs 300 to 305, which are the, the converted uh, questions of this. Saying that his teachings was, were being differently interpreted, they said, we have noted a grave disorientation and great confusion of many faithful regarding extremely important matters in the life of the Church. <clears throat> they argued that the Pope Francis meant to change the rules against the divorce and civilly be married receiving the sacraments or engaging in acts of sexual intimacy. It would affect changes in church teaching about marriage and sexuality and the nature of the sacraments. Two of the four cardinals, Carafa and Meissner, have since died. Other critics uh, include New York Times columnist uh, Russ Dutas, uh, Congress, who provocatively entitled an op-ed piece uh, in the New York Times, A Plot to Change Catholicism. And the Emeritus Bishop of Corpus Christi, Rene Henry uh, Graziada, uh, Graziada, who in September joined Bishop Bernard Fillet, head of the Systematic Society of St. Pius X. Interesting company. <laughs> in accusing Francis of several heretical positions, adding that if he doesn't answer these accusations, he would like to see him resign. So, pushback. There's, there's some pushback. Uh, although I think it's minor, but it's certainly real, and sometimes it comes from my places. Church historian Massimo Fattioli has noted a growing distance between Rome and the U.S. Catholic Church, which attributes to the uncomfortable relationship between Pope Francis and many of the American bishops. He points to a number of examples. First, he argues that some of the bishops seem to understand Dignitatis Humanae, the Vatican Council teaching on the list third, as being a freedom for the Church to rule the faithful as subjects rather than individuals making decisions in their freedom of conscience using as an example the objections of some uh, Catholics to the provisions of Obama's Affordable Care Act. Second, he suggests that the support of so many white Catholics for President Trump is evidence of a more nationalist American Catholicism, as opposed to Pope Francis's more global concerns. Finally, he sees Catholic the theology under Francis becoming much freer than under his immediate predecessors. It's becoming more global and contextual, as the churches of Latin America, Africa, and Asia increasingly find their own voices. In another place, Fagioli writes that Francis is trying to disengage Catholicism from the culture wars with its narrow focus on issues of sex and abortion, moving beyond a Eurocentric paradigm as the first pope coming from the world church. You know, it's, we belong to a global church, and, and we really need to hear the voices of Asia, Africa, and Latin America, which is where the church is growing today as it continues to diminish in uh, North America and Europe. And that's something that's fascinating, this kind of demographic shift that's taking place today in the church uh, as more and more uh, of these new churches in the developed global south, as you say, uh, are neo-pedicostal churches, independent churches, non-liturgical churches, causing all sorts of new problems for Cuba. <clears throat> what is encouraging to me is that Francis is making efforts to appoint bishops who reflect his own pastoral approaches and priorities, especially here in the United States. Among the most outspoken is San Diego Bishop Robert McElroy, who had to speak here. Uh, yes, this man is a uh, very powerful voice. <clears throat> in his speech in Modesto, California, at the U.S. Regional Meeting of Popular Movements, McElroy characterized Donald Trump as a candidate of disruption, and he said, we have to be doing a little disruption. Quote, this is uh, McElroy. Now we must all become disruptors. We must disrupt those who would seek to send troops into our streets to deport the undocumented, to rip mothers and fathers from their families. We must disrupt those who portray refugees as enemies rather than as brothers and sisters in terrible need. 
We must disrupt those who train us to see Muslim men, women, and children as sources of fear rather than children of God. We must disrupt those who seek to rob our medical care, rob our medical care, especially from the poor. We must disrupt those who would take even food stamps and nutrition assistance from the mouth of children. We've got a lot of controversy in that church. That would be very outspoken. Newark's Cardinal Joseph Tobin characterized Trump's immigration policy as creating cruelty on innocent people. Efforts of the administration to roll back the DACA policy for protecting the dreamers have energized the USCCB to speak out against those signing the, con uh, those signing the conference's statement includes UC USCCB President Cardinal Daniel Leonardo uh, of Galveston, Houston, and Vice President Archbishop Jose Gomez of Los Angeles. My Archbishop, who has become very outspoken, my Archbishop Tobin is a very quiet, shy man, has become very outspoken on this issue. <clears throat> With more bishops speaking out, conflicts between the church and the administration may be inevitable. Uh, fourth, the pastorality of doctrine. Francis has insisted a number of times that he's not trying to change doctrine. Indeed, one cannot change doctrine by himself. The formulation and development of doctrine is the work of the whole church. Those familiar with church history know that doctrines develop and sometimes change because of the way they are received by churches and councils and lived out and practiced by the faithful. But Francis is trying, is, is trying to emphasize that doctrine is not an end in itself. It's always fundamentally pastoral. Its purpose is to bring us into a life giving relationship with Christ. At a gathering of bishops and church workers in Florence, he said, Christian doctrine is in fact not a closed system void of questions or doubts, but it is alive, restless, animated. Its face isn't rigid. Its body moves and develops. It has tender flesh. Its name is Jesus Christ. Now, that's a very poetic statement that needs to be unpacked a little bit. In a Morse Laetitia, he emphasizes that neither the synod nor his apostolic exhortation could provide a new set of general rules, canonical in nature, applicable to all situations. Always pastoral discernment is necessary. Let me take homosexuality as an example. Georgetown professor of social thought, John Langdon, has argued pervasively in American Magazine that what Francis is doing is prodding the church to think about what its stance should be towards homosexuality and homosexuals. He does not contradict the long tradition of Catholic moral teaching on the subject. What he contrasts is stance with beliefs, theoretical positions, or moral judgments about right or wrong. A stance recognizes that there are often limitations in our knowledge or teachings, that there are other factors at work, that there are new questions developing. A stance means a more nuanced response to an issue, recognizing other factors beyond specific judgments of right or wrong. It takes into account changing factors in the social context, the limited character of our knowledge, the need for greater understanding, and the importance of the church's pastoral relationships. A new stance for homosexuals and homosexuality requires, first of all, humility to acknowledge what we know and do not know about the contemporary situation of homosexuals, with much remaining unknown. Secondly, we must always respect the dignity of homosexuals as creatures of God, members of the community of the redeemed, and fellow citizens. He calls for forbearance, civility, and compassion in just the opposite of the culture wars. Many have been burdened or suffered wounds from homophobia. We need attitudes that will sustain conversion over time. Such a change of stance does not mean changing church teaching or even personal convictions, but finding new ways to acknowledge the dignity of others, in this case of uh, homosexual uh, men and women, gay men and women, and to develop effective pastoral strategies for reaching out and welcoming them. It means a more tentative, inquiring approach to ministry, even towards those in questionable unions. If it will not help resolve these disputed issues, 
An issue of stance can lead to greater understanding, mutual respect, and mutual cooperation. As Langdon says, it may serve as a partial model for addressing similar problems in the life of the church. As Langdon says, uh, where Catholic Christians have been putting more energy into a denunciation than into dialogue. And one example of that I bring up is this book by Father, uh, Jesuit Father James Martin, Building Bridges, How the Catholic Church of the LGBT Community Can Enter into Relations of Respect, Compassion, uh, and Sensitivity. Uh, I'm sure you're familiar with this. Uh, he was scheduled to speak at the Theological Conscience, the Conference, Theological College at Catholic University of America. And because of a rather mean-spirited website that is entitled Church Militant, there was all sorts of pressure brought on the school and they canceled the talk. Uh, they also canceled the talk uh, by uh, Professor Sean Copeland, who's a wonderful African-American scholar at uh, Boston College, who was going to speak at her alma mater uh, on astrology, not, not on the issues of sexuality, but they said this, this woman is, is too gay friendly. So this is part of what's going on in our community, uh, and uh, I, I raise this uh, because I think we need to be aware of, of some of this kind of reaction that, that is surfacing from certain areas of the Catholic community, which, which is very destructive of persons and, and certainly very mean-spirited, in my opinion. <clears throat> Perhaps another example of Pope Francis trying to lead Catholics to a new stance could be seen in regard to his approach to the controversy over birth control, he is trying to reframe the issue by situating it within the context of responsible parenthood. While defending Paul VI teaching, he cautions against families having too many children, saying that the church has many illicit ways to limit reproduction. At the same time, he rejects as ideological colonization, uh, I like that term, efforts of governments to force birth control programs on developing countries by tying them to uh, foreign aid. Francis's approach stressing, stressing the importance of experience, openness to the spirit, and discernment, and certainly trust in God's mercy is not always easy. Some prefer the apparent security of rules and objective norms, but he is not giving general permission for the divorced and remarried to receive Holy Communion. He's not trying to change doctrines. At the same time as he insists in Evangelium Gaudium, Evangelium Gaudium, realities are more important than ideas. This is one of these wonderful five principles that he articulates in Evangelium Gaudium. Reality is more important than ideas. In other words, you know, we should put theory over the concrete, practical lives of individual people. In Amoris Laetitia, he argues that each situation is different and conscience, which the church is to form, not replace, must always take the concrete situation into account. <clears throat> we are called not to a legalism, but to a careful discernment, to a trust in God and God's mercy. Uh, as Karl Rahner once said, every subtle theology, every dogma, every church law, every accommodation and denial of the church, every institution, every bureau of all its powers, Every holy liturgy and even brave mission has only one goal, uh, faith, hope, and love towards God and man. Finally, a word on, on the Church of the Poor. Uh, as Pope John XXIII, St. John XXIII, in his radio address of September 11, 1962, opened the Council, he spoke of the miseries faced by so many, suggesting that the Council present the Church present the church as the church of all and especially of the poor. Uh, and that sounds very much like the language of Pope Francis. Pope Francis has frequently returned to this theme in a much quoted section of his apostolic exhortation, Evangelii Gaudium, he wrote, I prefer a church which is bruised, hurting, and dirty because it has been out of the streets, rather than a church which is unhealthy for being confined and clinging to its own security. Chapter 4, the, the longest in the document, addresses the social dimensions of evangelization with a particular focus on the poor. Well, I want to say uh, just a word about the loss of youth, and let me try to finish this up in about five minutes and we can have some discussion. Uh, but I think this is a very important issue in terms of the life of the church today. <clears throat> a major 
major concern of all our churches is the de decreasing engagement in church life on the part of so many in Europe and Latin America. This is especially true of the, of the next generation. While the United States is home to more Christians than any other country, the percentage of adults 18 or older who describe themselves as Christians has dropped by nearly 8 percentage points since a similar study done in 2007. In 2007, there were an estimated 41 million Protestant adults in the U.S. And so 2014, there are roughly 36 million, a decline of 5 million, and that's a relatively short period of time. Uh, if we take a longer uh, view, the results were even more dramatic. Uh, between 1972 and 2012, the American Baptist Convention has declined by 12 percent, the uh, Lutherans and the ELCA by 25 percent, the United Methodists by 28 percent, uh, the Presbyterian Church in the United States by 34 percent, the Episcopal Church by 41 percent, and the United Churches of Christ by 46 percent, and even more than that. Disciples of Christ by 56%. Those are very significant uh, losses. It's also uh, reflected in many Protestant seminaries, which are in trouble, some of which some of the most oldest in the country are closing uh, because they're no longer getting seminarians and therefore they don't have the revenue to support these and pay the faculty and so forth. <clears throat> the losses are particularly evident among young adults. Overall, religiously unaffiliated people are more concentrated here than among any other group. 35% among the millennials, those born between 1981 and 1996, are numbered among the nuns. This is not sisters, this is N-O-N-E-S. You know, when they're asking, what's, what's your religious affiliation? And they say, none. <laughs> so that's, that's a new uh, phenomenon. What should be, therefore, a particular concern for us are these losses among young adults. San Diego Bishop Robert McElroy sees the diminishing participation of young adults in the life of the church as the most significant <coughs> pastoral challenge to the church in the United States. Too many today see institutional Christianity as simply irrelevant. And many reasons are, are brought forward for their disengagement. Some suggest it is due to the sexual abuse scandal or to the church's position on women and sexuality, especially homosexuality. Others point to a secular culture like ours today is, which gives little support for religious belief or commitment. Still others look at the fact that many of these young people come from homes where their parents have left their faith behind. This is certainly the experience of many of the young adults that I teach. All these factors play a role, but the problem may be even more fundamental. A recent Pew study, another great source for uh, these kinds of statistics, uh, says that as younger Americans enter adulthood, Catholics among them, they are far less likely to be sure about God's existence than their elders. Among the nuns, the number who do not believe in God has risen from 22% in 2007 to 33%. That's it, you don't have a belief in God. You're certainly not going to be uh, engaged in the life of the church. At the beginning of each undergraduate class, I asked students to write a religious autobiography to tell me something about their own religious backgrounds and faith journeys. Reading them is to open a window into the lives of so many of our young people. A fairly uh, composite profile of Catholic students from our very diverse student bodies. I put these together. One Catholic parent, uh, the, they have one Catholic parent, another from a different uh, Christian tradition or religion. Uh, one went to church as a child and received the sacraments of Eucharist and confirmation, but drifted away in high school. Their parents are no longer practicing, sometimes they're divorced. They left the choosing of a faith tradition up to the child. Very little parental support. Many believe in God as a vague force or a distant cosmic power, a higher power. They always say that. I mean, you believe in God, I believe in a higher power. What's that? Do you have a relationship with a higher power? Is it personal? Do you pray with a higher power? Or is it kind of like the force in Star Wars? <laughs> <clears throat> Some consider themselves spiritual or say you don't need organized religion to practice your faith. Numbers of religions are created by human beings. 
some acknowledge a willingness to reconsider or that they are searching or that they want to believe in God but are becoming more agnostic. A number mentioned anger towards God because of some tragedy, particularly the death of a friend or a loved one or a grandparent, which are very important to our young people. Um, others said they only pray when in some special need, which one said admittedly is selfish. One said, I wish my parents had been more serious about their faith, it would have helped me. A couple found that there were better person, they were better persons when active in the church or in the faith community. And a few said their faith and religious practice was extremely important to them, but these students were clearly in the minority. So, uh, of course, some of this can be seen as young adults moving beyond family traditions and parental expectations uh, to find their own ways. These young people need to discover their own faith, not just their parents. But the old answer that they come back, they'll come back to the faith when they marry and become parents themselves, no longer seems to hold. Many will join the nuns whose numbers continue to uh, increase. Or they may adopt a popular, culturally determined idea of God who created and orders the world and watches over human lives, who wants people to be happy and feel good about themselves, who doesn't need to be particularly involved in one's life except when needed, and certainly does not make any demands. Uh, this is what Christian Smith from Notre Dame calls moralistic therapeutic deism, which I think is kind of, it's a wonderful concept. It's, it's our popular cultural religious beliefs. Uh, it's, it's kind of like all these people who believe in angels but don't believe in God, if that makes any sense. <laughs> Without minimizing the problems that our church has to face, the problem of belief is all important. How do we communicate to others that a relationship with God gives light meaning and a sense of well-being to our lives. How can we help others to come to experience God's mysterious presence, to be sensitive to God's movement in their interior lives? How can we effectively witness to our own sense of a love that embraces and sustains us? We can't really show an experience of God, share an experience of God with our children if it hasn't been our own experience. Too often we have forgotten what Pope Paul VI said about witnesses. Modern man listens more willingly to witnesses than to teachers. And if he does listen to teachers, it is because they are witnesses. The church needs very much such witnesses today. The fact that Pope Francis has asked that the 2018 meeting of the Synod of the Bishops consider the theme youth, faith, and vocational discernment uh, is an encouraging sign, and I hope the civic planners find ways to seek input from young people themselves, uh, which I think is absolutely crucial. So I'm going to abbreviate my conclusion here, but I want to say just one thing. The, the hemorrhaging of our young people remains a challenge that needs to be addressed. Without its youth, the church has no future. We need their energy, their generosity, their creativity, and their gifts. Where the church in its life and ministry makes Jesus present in our very needy world. Or as Pope Francis said just this week in a video address to Canadian youth, quote, the world, the church are in need of courageous young people who are not cowed in the face of difficulties, who face their trials and keep their eyes open and their hearts open to reality, so that no one should be rejected or subject subjected to injustice, or to violence, or deprived of human dignity. Thank you very much. seems in the uh, struggle for the uh, translations and the liturgy it's a focus on the power of words versus the power of God. Uh, well, we have to obviously look at both, but how we pray, I, I think is very important. You know, uh, a, a translation of the Bible is not 
stress, a liturgical text has to come out of the experience of the people. Mm -hmm. And this is not to falsify it in any way, since mm -hmm. this principle of dynamic equivalence is something that any language teacher recognizes. You can't simply move from one language to another on the basis of a mm -hmm. very literal translation. Mm -hmm. you, you have to ask, what does it mean? What does it say? How do we express this in our own language, idiom, and, uh, and so forth? So I, I think that's really what's going on. And I, I would ask, especially the priests here, you know, who have had to preside with this liturgy, you know, how can we not as comfortable as we found this easy uh, <laughs> way to pray? And you've got tongue tied in the middle of some endless college that goes on and on. And it's for the glory. We have a wonderful translation of the glory, which simplified the, mm. you know, the, 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 the uh, subordinate clauses mm. of, of the glory. Did you be more <laughs> what day? <laughs> no, no, it's only one of those two. Thank you. Well, the problem is everybody's in agreement. That's This is a loving group. Yeah, yeah. I did so. I was surprised at the statistics you gave for the loss of Protestants between 1972 and 2012, I believe. Uh, I wasn't aware that the percentages had dropped so much. Have any of the Protestants, like Lutherans, Episcopalians, and so forth, uh, give an analysis or explanation of why this has been happening? Any guesses on their part? You know, I think they've all tried to address that in various ways, just as we have. Uh, I, I don't know of any specific efforts that I could point out to you, but I know they're all concerned about it. it it's more serious. I have skipped a good part of this year. Uh, especially as obvious in the um, 80% of Protestant seminaries and divinity schools are experiencing financial difficulties that are going to bring about real changes. And this is, this is an, uh, an effect of diminishing numbers and diminishing uh, vocations to, to the ministry. So it's, it's already uh, playing a very significant role. At, at the Graduate Theological Union in Berkeley, and I don't think I said this, the Lutherans who have this beautiful campus on the top of the hill, the GTU is a, a union of nine uh, Christian seminaries and a couple the Lutherans have sold their beautiful property to the Muslims who are going to establish a four-year college there, and now they're leasing uh, property uh, in uh, Berkeley. So it's, it's a little bit more of the same thing. And just another way of looking at that is to say, you know, what churches, Catholic Church, of course, has lost a lot of people. Uh, I skipped over those statistics, but something like 12% um, of Americans today are uh, non-practicing Roman Catholics. Uh, and it's certainly a, a larger number of them young Catholics today. But the Catholic Church has a better reputation of preserving its own, according to the Pew Forum. That is to say, more Catholics remain in the church in spite of our own losses. That is true of Protestant churches. So, uh, I mean, there's, there's a lot of statistical evidence to, to back all that up. What the reasons are, you know, there's a multitude of reasons that I was trying to suggest. Well, Father Rogers, thank you. Okay. Just speculate a little bit about, uh, you mentioned Cardinal Sarah several times. Uh, Francis, excuse me, get rid of Gerard Mueller. Mueller. Uh, why doesn't he get rid of Sarah? Well, he's trying to be diplomatic. I, that's my answer. You know, I, I suspect, you know, uh, he's trying to, you know, he's really moved strongly on this Carter Burke, who probably has been leading the, the, child, the charge of this. Francis um, Carlo Carlo is an African cardinal. Uh, he's a, a you know, respected churchman. There's a, one of my pro current projects is a work on global Catholicism, and I'm fascinated in Africa. The split between the older members of the hierarchy, many of whom are Roman trained, uh, like Sarah and uh, uh, what's his name, uh, Arinze, and this whole new younger generation of African nuns and priests and lay people who are doing doctorates in first class schools, and we're talking about 
uh, a much more African uh, expression of Christianity in the church, which is very interesting. Uh, so I think Francis wants to be respectful, uh, but he also, you know, it's interesting. I remember when Francis was elected, of course, a lot of Jesuits were not happy when he was elected because he had a bad reputation from his days as provincial in Argentina, and he acknowledged he made a lot of mistakes. One thing he learned was you have to listen to others. But the first thing I heard about him was this man understands power and he likes to use it. <laughs> I thought that was a very insightful remark because for a Pope Benedict, he's a wonderful, wonderful, wonderful theologian, but governance was not his thing. All he wanted to do was write his next Christology book in his study. You know, so he didn't make the transition very well from, from being a theologian to being uh, you know, the one who presides over the life of the church. And that's not Francis. Francis is used to that kind of thing. So I think he's, he's you know, he's, he's not going to ramrod his, his position too, but he's not going to be overpowered either. Okay. One behind you there, Jack? Yes, when you were speaking um, on the uh, subject of homosexuality, yeah. and I thought you alluded to the fact that the church wouldn't need to change its teachings but we do need to change the hearts of the people of the church, the Catholics. Now, how, I don't know how to, how do you change the hearts of that Catholic when your teachings haven't changed? How do you do that when a Catholic is trying to follow the teachings of the church? Right. You're saying, we're saying that when we need to have dignity for the homosexual person, how, how, do you, how is the church going to change the heart of the person who doesn't have that dignity for that homosexual person? Well, I think that's one of the important things about Jim Martin's book, uh, Building a Bridge, because he's trying to talk about both how the church can be more respectful of the gay and lesbian community and how the LGBT, I always get tongue tied on those initials, how this community can be more responsive and respectful of the church. So it's a very worthwhile kind of thing. And to have it dismissed uh, as it has been uh, is, is very disappointing, I think. It's, it's a good effort. We start with respect. We start by using the kind of language, you know, the, the church, you know, bishops always want to homosexual persons, you know, instead of gays and lesbians, because, you know, we, in ecumenism, you always address the other by the way they want to refer to themselves. And I think the same thing should be true to the way we talk about, you know, uh, um, gay and lesbian people, not use same-sex language and that kind of thing. I think it's also true, you know, if we learn to be a little more accepting of each other, that we are becoming a little bit more like the example of our Lord, who says that we should have this kind of respect uh, for one another, that we belong to one community, that we have these, these enormous differences. And while it's true that Francis is not trying to change doctrine and can't do it all by himself, if we change our attitudes and the way we, we relate to each other. It may be that in some some you know, future day there will be a kind of change. You know, a lot of these questions about uh, human sexuality are relatively new, and, and that means sometimes we have to rethink some of our moral theology. How old is the concept of sexual orientation instead of sexual preference? I mean, uh, and has our moral theology really? caught up with that. So we have a lot of difficult issues. You know, that this trans uh, issue today is very hot on our campus right now. It's one I'm struggling with myself. Uh, it's, become, it's, it's kind of moved from gay and lesbian issues to the issues of uh, you know, multiple genders. We now have a new law in California that we have three genders recognized by the state that was just signed by Governor Brown. So these are also issues that we have to how do we address these things in a way that's faithful to our tradition and respectful of the other? It's a, a real challenge for all of us. And I think it's a spiritual problem. Uh, you know, when we find ourselves, you know, reducing it to culture wars or, or to dismissive statements about the other, then we could be lost. Uh, and we're not, we're not going to move forward. I don't know if that's helpful. Well, I, I have another question. Um, had to do with your final um, emphasis um, on, on the youth that have left the church. Um, 
how, how do we get, how are we going to address those creative youth if they've left the church and um, have found that the church um, <clears throat> does not accept the cosmic God, the God of all, but has has decided there's exclusions. And so all I can uh, speak from is the, the, the youth that I know, which are my own children. Um, how do I get them to uh, change their hearts about the church if the church hasn't yet, and once again, the teachings haven't changed? And that's what they're looking at. They're looking at the teachings and saying, but the church doesn't teach that God is cosmic and everyone's included. Well, I'm not sure that's true. Uh, I'm, you know, in fact, I disagree with that. I'm a big fan of Elizabeth Johnson and John Hodge and people like this who talk about how God is working in the evolutionary process of bringing, you know, about God's own mysterious um, goals in his own way. There's a wonderful poem by T. Wright Chardin called The Slow Work of God. I love that title. I just did a book about with that. The Slow Work of God. You know, you did, you know, if God could work slowly and patiently, then we need to be a little more patient ourselves, I think. But I would ask, how do you teach this to your children? I don't know. I don't have an answer. I, I have to listen to my students. Uh, I'm going to have a class next week when we're going to look at a couple of articles on spirituality, and then I would raise this question. You know what? Why has it been so difficult for young people to believe in God? Is it institutional bias, which is very strong among the millennial generation, especially from their Gen X parents? Uh, is it because their parents didn't see it as significant? There are all these reasons. Uh, but we certainly have to listen to them also. Uh, and I, I, you know, I'm not one to go out and go, we have some doctors we need to develop, and there's no question about that. But I'm not, you know, I'm a theologian, I'm not interested in changing all sorts of doctrines, but I'm, doctrines embody in more or less adequate ways the riches of our faith. Uh, and I think we can find ways to explain that that are not uh, prejudicial or exclusionary to others, so we have to work out to do that. Right. Now, I believe, if I can say one more thing, um, the children are learning experientially from their parents. And so their, their God is really, when they are born, their God is their parents. That's the first experience they have with God. So that is extremely important right there. And then they, it moves from there, from their parents, they start to observe, make observations about their life and, and people are in it. And they, and they and they go to church. They're going to church with their parents. And they are making observations about what's going on in the church and also with the people and between the people in the church. And that's that's why I think we're we're losing a lot of youth is because they're not seeing um, God's love between the people in the church. They're not seeing that. And that's that's a hard thing to change, but I guess you got to change the hearts of the people. I think that would be the last question. Okay. First, I, I want to thank you, Father Ouch, uh, for a very informative and wonderful uh, speech. And uh, <laughs> we at the university are on the front line. Yeah. You know that as well as I. Uh, but uh, the best part of it was uh, we found out through your talk what a wonderful gift Pope, Pope, Pope Francis is to the institutional church and to John. Yes, thank you for saying that. And thank you all for coming. I really appreciate it. And uh, I'm happy to announce that uh, uh, I want to announce that uh, Dr. Natalia Imperatore, the Associate Professor of Religious Studies at Manhattan College, Where? will join us as a speaker oh, at our next That's where my brother is. Are you a brother or not? March 22nd. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you.